Philip Arnaud, the director and founder of the Center for International Theater Development, uh, and the president of the Martin Boros International Fan Club. Uh, <laughs> and we are here to talk with um, Daniela Topol, the artistic director of the Rattlestick Playwrights Theater, playwright Jonathan Payne, and Martin, the aforementioned wonderful director from Hungary that I've known for almost a decade. Um, and I think he's one of the most interesting directors working right now. I followed his work um, and it, with great variety from, an, from operas to wonderful mind bending uh, pieces in the theater to unique things like a, a, a drive around in a bus, a promenade uh, that we helped him do both in Baltimore and in Albuquerque and now have been following uh, like a uh, like a very interesting grandfather uh, this four-year project that brought us together today. Uh, I was able to see last night a dress rehearsal uh, and I was just so inspired knowing the, the history of this uh, incredible project. Four years of doing, of bringing people together not, you know, if you were all lived in one block in New York City and were able to pull this off, I would have been standing up and giving you a standing ovation. But the fact is that this was, you know, a, a true international collaboration. Um, it, it was stunning for me to be there last night. Uh, I want to do two thank yous. Uh, before we start, though, I want to thank HowlRound. Um, HowlRound is celebrating its 10th anniversary, uh, and we've had so many good projects with them, and I think they're so important to the theater ecology in America, uh, and I wish them a very, very happy uh, 10th anniversary, and uh, you can donate money to help them keep going, so I would highly recommend uh, you do that. Uh, and then I want to thank the four of you for being here. Uh, just a real quick introduction. Um, I spent many years putting my body in theater seats, sometimes seeing as many as 300 performances a year when I was hopping from festival to festival and seeing four or five a day. Um, when probably in 2016, I went to Urani, which is a wonderful uh, uh, developmental nurturing uh, incubator space in Budapest into a classroom, no stage lights. I'd heard about this production. Uh, I saw everything. There was no pretense. And I didn't know what to expect. I had a script in front of me, a translation, because it was being performed in Hungarian. And Martin was sitting over my shoulder, pointing out where the, the text was going. Um, and then I stayed around afterwards. And there was a sort of a coda afterwards. And I left that theater changed. And I tried to shake, I tried to sort of say, wait a minute, th this really didn't happen to me, but it did. Uh, and it's, it, it, and Martin, I've told you this before many times, uh, I wanted every human being who walks the streets of America and walks past these people to be able to experience this really getting inside of 
what is essentially this shared humanity we have with people that are far too often written off and you guys pulled it off last night and uh, I salute you and I thank you. So I'm gonna try to almost disappear. That's hard for me to do, but Daniela, I'd like you to talk about this incredible journey of four years that, you know, in spite of everything thrown in your way, uh, how we've arrived to this moment where this weekend, this piece gets open uh, to the public in a very different manifestation than it was originally, but something that's for our time and our country. Um, thank you so much, Philip. And maybe we can do that narrative together, Martin and Jonathan, but I'll just give a little bit of context and say that Philip Arnaud has been like the godfather of this project. <laughs> it never would have happened without him saying, you need to, when I went to the Duna Park Festival in Hungary in 2017, you need to come to this festival. The Trust for Mutual Understanding was so supportive in making sure that it was possible for me and a number of other theater producers and presenters to attend that festival and you need to meet Martin Barash. So that was the first instruction and Martin and I had a chance to talk and I had a chance to see his incredible piece, um, Addressless, and I too felt exactly like Philip felt after seeing it. You know, I am, I am different now than I was two hours ago. I am different now. I am the conversations I've just engaged in, the what I've just experienced, it has changed my life. And I just fell in love with the piece. And it it is just an incredible mix of both the theater, theatrical gaming, and essential community conversations. It's an individual experience and a collective experience simultaneously. And I think that makes it so profound. You're sort of watching it from your own perspective, but also really understanding things from other people's perspectives as well. Um, so our first step was to figure out the right playwright to work with Martin to adapt this for the New York City. And a beautiful playwright named Corey Thomas said, you need to talk to Jonathan Payne because Jonathan Payne is an incredible playwright who's also a beautiful social worker working in um, about and inside of uh, these issues and these questions. Um, and so mm -hmm. and Jonathan then met each other and maybe I will sort of pass the baton. Maybe we could do sort of communal storytelling here. Um, about the making of the piece for this incarnation to Jonathan Martin to sort of talk about what what happened between the two of you when you first met one another. Ah, great. Uh, that's a great hopscotch. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I met Daniela and uh, she talked a bit about the play. And um, I mean, even before it, I, I was like, well, of course it's, it, of course it's me. It makes sense that they would want to talk to me. Um, uh, by day, I was a social worker. I am a social worker, and I was uh, supporting people who were formerly uh, homeless, but now uh, was transitioning into supportive housing. So I had a background in that, um, and so. Um, I think my experience of coming from the theater and stepping into uh, uh, housing insecurity and supporting people who were housing insecure, um, it seemed like such a, a great way to uh, work on a play because the audience's experience was very much my experience of stepping into this work as someone who has a background in theater and wasn't really thinking about uh, any type of social work at the time um, when I graduated. So um, uh, Daniela talked about the play and, you know, I, I am a lover of Brecht and, you know, I, I love very creative and interactive theater and stuff that makes people think. And uh, so um, it, it it was a match, a match made in heaven. Um, and so um, I was introduced to Martin and uh, the script was sent to me to read through. And 
what was really fascinating to me, uh, you step into that situation and you're like, oh, well, I am the adapter and there's all these things that I will have to do to sort of shift the play and have it make sense for a New York audience. And surprisingly, I was like, oh, you know, it was familiar. I was like, oh, this is, I, I am reading something that I know. There is nothing that is very unfamiliar or strange. Um, it was uh, universal. Um, and so in terms of using the word adapting, it's kind of funny because, um, yeah, I think Martin and I sort of saw eye to eye in terms of the understanding of what, what the piece is and uh, what the intention is. Um, and so, uh, I think that's probably a, a good way to pass the baton to Martin. Uh, um, I came in a little later in the process and um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's been a great experience. Yeah, uh, all of the above. And then, <laughs> and then I remember our first conversation and Jonathan expressed that um, this uh, theme um in general and all the elements of the dramaturgy um stigmatization uh, of uh, people experiencing homelessness or housing insecurity the prejudice of the society victim blaming and the health related issues and mental issues and addictions that in most cases are not the cause, but the result of experiencing homelessness, these are all not foreign um, for him from his experience, um, so he can relate to it. But at the same time, he was open to revision um, the, the piece because I think one of the first things we did is um, we embrace the idea that we want to keep the, the gaming structure. We are talking about um, an interactive theatrical game, which now is an interactive online play um, in the New York version, or we could say a theatrical computer game, really. Uh, so we, we decided to keep the general structure that the audience is divided into teams to lead the free main characters of the story who lost their homes for different reasons. And uh, they have to face a number of difficulties um, that are mostly unknown to an average person. Uh, and in these situations, the audience um, have to make decisions to direct their lives. And uh, luckily, Jonathan really liked this idea. And also that uh, we think of this as a strategy game uh, where uh, people, um, fight for survival and uh, money is also in stakes because the goal of the game is for the audience and for the characters that they are leading to get back to housing and start a new life. Uh, but as we were scanning through the script, we realized that uh, the characters are not always um, applicable or not, not that doesn't, don't, uh, necessarily make sense in an American or more specifically in a New York context. So that, that was one of the first steps to figure out who these three main characters could be. And uh, maybe Jonathan can tell about it in more detail, uh, but we ended up choosing a veteran, um, an LGBTQ person who is a runaway um, from upstate New York and a single parent. Um, and we, um, we decided to keep that aspect of the original piece that we have a social worker in the cast um, who, uh, besides being a consult, uh, helping us with the script and being uh, one of our cons consultants, uh, also uh, will be the game host and the, the master of ceremony in the piece plus one of the uh, characters and we weren't sure which character this uh, is going to be uh, one of the the characters should be a person with lived experience and someone who is an activist and someone who can also represent himself instead of just playing simply a role and also um, 
um, articulate and and um, and present uh, their cause. So I think that was that was the first and most important uh, step in the development phase. And that was a bit of a journey to figure out who the right social worker and activist could be. Um, and I, we're so lucky and privileged to work with Hope Beaver as the social worker who works at um, Henry Street Settlement and is the master of ceremonies. And Shams DeBaron, otherwise known as the homeless hero, is the activist. And they um, are bringing such integrity and authenticity to the project because this is their lived experience. Um, so for a long while, we thought we were gonna actually be producing the play in Rattlestick and traveling it to the boroughs. Um, and at the time we were planning to do that in partnership with a working theater and then there was COVID, and can you could you put a timestamp on that? Like um, when I, we the, were, that the first thing was in what eighteen? Yeah, so I think Jonathan and Martin had a retreat together in twenty eighteen, um, and started partnering um, with a couple of different artists at different phases. Katie Pearl and Tamala Woodard, both of whom were really wonderful collaborators on the development of the concept and the script and a series of other experts and consultants. Um, and all of that I think was from 2018 into 2019. And then um, we were planning to produce the piece in 20. 20 uh in the season of 2020 2021 basically the year that then was covid um so i do remember some <laughs> intense conversations in the spring of 20 trying to figure out how we reimagined the piece and whether it was possible to reimagine the piece in a different kind of way um Either of you want to speak about the wrapping our heads around reimagining the piece in some way? Um, it, it's interesting to think about the timing of it because uh, there are periods where homelessness suddenly pops up into the mainstream and then we tend to forget about it and then it pops up again um, and the pandemic uh, has been a great sort of window into what uh, uh, housing insecurity is in terms of uh, even in terms of people who you know had quote unquote normal lives who had a job who had a place to live um, and what the pandemic did to them in terms of income in terms of uh, you know, feeling safe. Uh, one of the big things that's happening is, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, I guess the mortgage moratorium is, you know, ending. And so, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, terrible, horrible things that could happen down the line. And I think uh, to actually get together and figure out how we can present this piece um, at this time, at this crazy period, um, made a lot of sense to me um, and even found its way into the script. Um, and so uh, it's interesting that we were thinking about the virus and, and exploring that within the script. And then, you know, Shams de Baron came along, who was quite a, a big beacon or representative uh, for uh, those who were housing insecure, those who were in the shelters at the time. I, he was a, a, a vocal figure during the Lucerne Hotel on the Upper West Side um, and the men who were housed there. Um, so, uh, I, I, yes, uh, the play had to live on and um, it definitely made sense to me in terms of this period and incorporating it into the play. Um, and after uh, putting the deciding on 
postponing and putting the concept in a quarantine to nurture a little bit. I think it was this, I mean, last 20, 21 January when we finally decided that uh, it should be an online piece um, to make it uh, COVID proof, but also to take that um, opportunity to make it as accessible as possible. So not only uh, people from New York could uh, possibly see it, and also because it's so adequate to its uh, content, because it's um, because it's a game and it's not um, something that people would be unfamiliar with um, in front of a screen. Uh, but at the same time, it was we realized that it's very challenging, and I personally had to. I I I had a struggle um, about this because while it's exciting artistically, it's um, um, we, we need to fight the stigmatization of the Zoom performances and uh, and um, um, aesthetically or or artistically limited or visually limited pieces that a lot of theaters came up with as a reaction to the pandemic. Um, and we agreed, of course, that we would not like to do um, something like that um, but it's but it's like I said it, we started to think about it as a theatrical computer game that's featuring film and music and um, um, animations and a lot of interactive parts because the core of this piece is that uh, um, the reason why sometimes we refer to it, or I refer to it as a democracy game, is that there are a lot of um, uh, discussions within the audience. And uh, those are uh, the most provocative and most risk-taking risk and uh, the most funny and uh, entertaining and exciting parts, not just from an audience perspective, but for us creators too, when people make a fist fight about uh, whether they should take this uh, deal or run away or uh, let other people humiliate them or fight for their rights, uh, go to a shelter um, and live among restrictions and let uh, the system chip away your autonomy or go on the street uh, where you can nearly freeze or be someone under someone's thumb and couch surf. So in all these uh, dilemmas, um, everyday people walk into a truly unknown space and uh, they, they must think together uh, about things that they would normally not think about. It's, it's been really exciting. Uh, to watch the cast uh, work through the piece um, because it demands <laughs> it demands a lot of an actor. Um, not only are you memorizing texts, but you are there live with people and discussing uh, the situations that come across and how you'll hand you know which way which way you should go. And so um, I do have to after watching. Uh, the run yesterday, really, I have to give my hats off to the actors. And just to think about the actors and their expertise, we are also asking a social worker and an activist to step into the piece and not only be representatives of themselves, but you know, play in this world called acting um, and to also uh, interact with people live. Uh, it's insane to think of the weight of that, um, to give that to someone. And it's been really uh, uh, flooring and exciting uh, to see the two of them uh, step into those roles and, you know, wear them comfortably. I, you know, I, it's not like we auditioned a lot of people and, you know, we, we had to pull from what we could get, especially during a pandemic. I mean, who's thinking about that stuff at this time. And so uh, there's a lot of uh, luck involved in uh, what has happened. Um, and so 
uh, I just want to give space to uh, the actors and uh, the new actors uh, uh, and their experience of the piece. Yeah, and, um, and there was an important pivotal shift that happened in the middle of December because we were planning to make the piece, um, record the film sections and then have Rattlestick be essentially like the TV studio for it where all the actors would be gathering in the, in the studio with the technicians and the designers, everyone together so that the live portions would be happening at Rattlestick. And with Omicron, then everything um, just needed to shift again. And so that was not an unstressful moment. <laughs> and, and so it became about, you know, how do we set things up so that the um, actors' homes or wherever they can be based to perform the show can be, you know, we just have a series of separate studios now, essentially. So our incredible production team then sent laptops to everybody and lights and microphones and set pieces so that the everybody could engage in making this piece as safely as possible, which meant that everybody had to be essentially performing this pretty much independently instead of being in a, in a space altogether. And, um, just watching Martin navigate that complexity in such a beautiful way, keeping the team really cohesive with exciting, exciting design simultaneously with engaging the artists and the Zoom managers and all these things to, to make a cohesive event, even while everybody is remote is, is quite a feat. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, I think part of the reason why everyone works so hard in this project that is that, uh, um, speaking of the cast, I think they find challenges and good challenges in that. And it's also a tool for them. It's, it's artistically special because they got to make uh, film pieces. Uh, they were engaged actively in the music making. Uh, and and there is this uh, always mysterious uh, field of interaction and uh, facilitation of the of the live discussions that uh, that uh, keeps surprises every single day. And there's hope and there's shams who can really make their the the cause uh, vocal and. Uh, and this is where art and activism meets and it becomes um, artivism. And, uh, and um, it's, um, so they, they can, uh, they, they don't need to put aside what's really their life and what's really important for them, but use address less as a, as a different kind of tool to fight for uh, what they fight in the, everyday life and uh, yeah I I'm I'm very lucky that the the design team and the production team just uh, thinks it's gonna be a good it's it's a concept that that suits New York and it's it's a it's a script written by Jonathan that people should see uh, and experience, and and I think that's that's one of the reasons why, despite of all the uh, obstacles, it's it's going to open in the end. I just wanted to add one thing to the pre-recorded film pieces. I think this was part of the concept that was also something we came up with uh, last January. Uh, when we were thinking about how this can be uh, online and despite of uh, producing for screen, how it could be, uh, and despite of not having a movie budget and um, the stuff for uh, um, making cinema, how it can be still uh, something engaging. And, uh, and then we came up with the idea that um, every single scene 
uh, is played out um, and it's a video and then around two thirds of the scene there is a point where where it becomes a fork and uh, we can decide whether we go to scenario a or b and uh, it's it's all up to the audience and meanwhile uh, as i was telling people about it they were familiar with this because of netflix that um, i think introduced the first uh, show that has a similar format this summer this last summer uh, so it's also just something I find interesting that uh, now it's uh, it this kind of format became a common sense because of pop culture too. So I think people who will experience this, they they will find themselves in a familiar space. Daniela, could I ask you to talk a little bit? about where this fits into the puzzle of Rattlestick. Because we're looking at lots of leadership changes in the American theater. And I think that your leadership and taking over Rattlestick has been one of the success stories of really redefining a theater. Uh, can you just take a minute and talk about how this locked into, because I've seen other work and I've been following what you've done, how this is a part of the vision of where you're taking Rattlestick? Um, sure, and thank you for, um, <laughs> thank you for those kind words. I mean, um, Rattlestick has always been committed to supporting playwrights and new work, so an ambitious work. So that was all, that's always been part of the DNA. And then, um, you know, a few years ago when I took over, it became about um, really digging in and creating opportunities to see work that responds to the complexity of our culture. And so we've produced a lot of work in conversation with community partners, um, a lot of work that prioritizes making sure that those um, who have lived experience are welcome into the room and can really respond to the work in an organic way. Um, and that has been really important that, that it's not about making issue theater, but about finding and creating a work that is deeply compelling and, um, and that is really addressing the ache of our humanity and that there's a large umbrella for what is under the ache of our humanity um, and uh, various projects like Corey Thomas's lockdown um, that dealt with long-term incarceration is one example, Kuzi Cram's Novenas for a Lost Hospital that dealt with um, hospitals and the closing of hospitals. That was an, is another example. And there's a series of different projects along the way that really address um, really kind of lean into that space. I love this expression, artivism, that Martin, you were just talking about, about the Venn diagram between art and activism and what lives in between. And I think that's actually where Martin and Stereo Act and Rattlestick actually really gel with one another. I love um, your passion for all of those things too, Martin, that has been part of the DNA of who you are as an artist and the work that your company makes. Um, and then I would say we have a really big passion to support immigrant artists and international stories. Um, we have a wonderful managing director, UA, and she's really led with a, with a company of um, immigrant artists and other international artists, um, an annual festival to support immigrant artists and global perspectives. We have a monthly global forum called Global Gab. And so a number of different programs that are really saying, how can we um, create opportunities for artists um, from different parts of the world? A lot of whom are immigrants, but in general, how do we create a platform where we can hear stories from other artists? So just the fact that this is this beautiful international collaboration, not just with Martin and Jonathan, but we have a number of international artists on the team. Um, we have, um, you know, a beautiful Brazilian um, 
set designer and props designer, Patricia. We have um, a beautiful animator from Japan. Um, so it's, it's, it's really um, exciting to see how the international collaboration that is part of our DNA is the DNA of this project as well. So this really fits in the sweet spot of a lot of things we're passionate about. We have um, a couple of important community partners on this project, community access and urban pathways. And um, just uh, there's just so many different ways in which this project is responding to things we are so passionate about. Um, and even though it's what I what I was struck about it seeing in Hungary is that even though it was focused on Budapest when I, the version I saw, it was totally relatable to New York, as Jonathan mentioned. And I think this version is totally relatable to any other city. It's there are real universalities. Mm -hmm. There are specifics that would be adapted for a particular city. Um, or a particular country. But in reality, I think what's so exciting about this is that this really speaks to so many different um, communities and perspectives that feels quite universal. And Martin, I, as I say, followed your work very closely. And you're at a, a moment in your career where you're making choices about what you do. Um, I know that. And you made a huge commitment to this project. Where did this, where was your sweet spot in finding uh, Rattlestick? Because there were a number of moments I know that we all agreed that could be exit ramps. And you didn't take those exit ramps. <laughs> You kept pushing. So somehow that fed Daniela and that must have fed you. Could you talk about that for a minute? Sure. So, yeah, I think the most important was Rattlesticks or specifically Daniela's commitment to it. It's not an easy uh, project and it's it's clear that it's uh, it's a it was clear from the beginning and it's just became clearer and clearer how big of a, a commitment it uh, it is and how complex it is. And uh, we always knew that there is never going to be more than 60 uh, people who can, uh, more than 60 people taking part at once. Uh, we knew that it's probably not going to run throughout months and months and months. Um, and... Uh, and despite of this, and and that um, uh, rattlesnake needs to bring me over from Hungary and uh, and have me here throughout the entire uh, process. So uh, I understood that these are uh, challenges, and um, and um, the only reason to do this is the true interest in in the content or in this concept. And uh, I really appreciated it. And um, and uh, if I um, I can't imagine producing the exact same piece twice um, ever in my career, really. Um, but uh, as I understood how I can find ways, uh, uh, how this can be different, and. Uh, um, and what I can gain artistically and as a human from the collaborators uh, and and all the partners and and Jonathan personally, uh, it uh, it became clear that I have more to <laughs> gain from this obviously than than uh, what what I what I invest in it. Um, so um, yeah, it's. Um, for me, working or um, making theater, um, even if it's uh, beneficial or serves the society in any way, it's never charity. It's um, there's there's always a personal ambition in that, and um, in one word, that uh, ambition is growing um, artistically or as a human, and and I felt the potential in that. Um, here. 
I, I think what also lifted uh, the piece for me was the uh, collaboration as well, just in terms of, um, I, I guess in improv, they have this thing where you say yes and, um, and I think Martin and I were very much, you know, uh, uh, yes and. Uh, 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 collaboration has a potential for much conflict and uh, many disagreements, but it seems like uh, we definitely sort of gelled and, you know, um, there would be, you know, we, I wasn't too sure how the filmed uh, parts would look, you know, I come from a playwright background, I, I can write, you know, TV and film stuff, but the, the melding of that was interesting to think about. Um, so even in rehearsal, you know, uh, Martin would be like, oh, I'm thinking there's going to be a, a ding here. And I'm like, oh, okay. I, all right. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. But then in the action and seeing it presented, I was like, oh yeah, that, that makes so much sense. Um, and I, I, I think that's a testament to, um, of, of course, a writer wants their script to be lifted and, uh, and grow. And so, yes, there was my presentation of what the play is, but uh, what really built it was the, the joining of the two of our sort of understandings and visions and that great sort of yes and. <laughs> um, and so that's been a real gift of that collaboration, especially um, being involved in something that is somewhat, you know, selfless in the sense that you are putting forward people who don't usually get put forward. And so uh, the cohesion of that towards something that is important and needs to be talked about uh, uh, has been such a great experience. Um, and uh, one of the highlights was a run through we did. And that's when we met we did a read through and uh, and Shams uh, de Baron um, and some other participants were there in the end and the conversation was uh, so uh, jarring and flooring and uh, I don't know, it hit me. I couldn't speak at the end. So I felt really like I can't say anything. I, I'm too emotional right now. Um, uh, but I, that's one of the things I want to highlight is those after conversations If you know, if people can stick around, um, it's, it's amazing what comes out of that. Um, I saw Corey Thomas's play at Rattlestick um, and it was fascinating to see people who were formerly incarcerated sitting amongst people who don't have an idea of what that experience is and just the power of those voices to be brought into the room and what that means to uh, the, you know, the common man's ear um, uh, is uh, such a fascinating thing to witness. Mm -hmm. Let me ask another question. Um, when I look into my dark crystal ball, uh, I see the touring, international touring, as being very, very cloudy uh, in the coming in the coming years. Actually, I think you know that it's going to take a long time for us to bounce back from the pandemic. I think that uh, what will be happening it could be happening here poli uh, politically of isolation, the difficulty of getting visas, etc. Uh, while there's nothing easy about not to uh, about what you all have done, which is a collaboration between an artist, a foreign artist and an American company, or the other way, an American artist and a, and a foreign country, a foreign company, um, I think that's in the near future gonna be one of the major lifelines along with a baseline of trying to keep conversations going between us, no matter what's going on about airplanes, what's going on about politics, that we've made uh, relationships that are 
friend uh, or Copanis or people that, Daniela, you're going to want to talk to Martin four years ago just because you're thinking about something and you want to hear what he might think about. Uh, and so if I'm, if my crystal ball is anywhere near right, I see the real growth and the, the growth potential is in the kinds of projects that you've just done. And I've been involved with a goodly number of those as well as touring. Uh, finished pieces. But Martin, you've done deep uh, work with two American companies now that I know well. And you've left them better. I think they've left you better. Um, and can, can what can you, can you talk about what's really baseline quintessential about making that collaboration work from what you've just experienced in this one? From your side, Martin, and from your side, Daniela and Jonathan, what's the baseline? Curiosity is important, I, I imagine, because if you come to not just an international, but to any kind of collaboration without real curiosity and openness, you can pretend it for a while, but uh, in the end it will clash uh, and uh, it will result in compromised work and in, in conflicts. So that probably plus you need curiosity and openness to understand the difference in norms and and cultural codes and uh, <clears throat> speaking a language somewhat or uh, in an upper intermediate level is not not it doesn't equal understanding the culture. Um, so that's that's something that uh, I needed to learn, for example, throughout these works and. Um, um, for me, these the the ground where I uh, that allowed me to meet parts of the culture were always within um, a theatrical work, which is partially nice because there are um, because uh, people who who like generally think about the word similarly and and uh, inclusive and. Uh, and open-minded, uh, tolerant people, and um, but that's uh, but that that, that um, getting to know them will never authorize me to make statements about uh, um, phenomenons um, that I observe here. I can I can chime in and I can uh, pose pose questions, but. Um, to me, when I work abroad, it's always important to uh, provoke instead of make statements because because I I'm always aware of um, this position of being an outsider. Um, I'm not sure if if this is an answer to your question. It's a great answer. Daniela. Sorry, were you about to say something? Else? No, I, I was saying I saw you getting ready to say something. I hope. Um, I mean, I think I would totally echo the curiosity, and um, I think uh, ability to be really flexible. I mean, particularly at this time when what does it mean to make work, and how do you make it, and various challenges and being able to, I mean, what has been amazing about watching um, your leadership through this, Martin, is that you, you've been very clear about what you intend to make and also very flexible and collaborative simultaneously. And that is a really hard balance. Um, and, you know, it's super exciting to find like-minded collaborators 
um, who come from different parts of the world um, that in many ways are, you know, the, the collaboration is more similar than someone who lives down the street. And that's feels like just so magical and fun. Um, I think we've been very, very lucky and fortunate to have such um, advocacy and support from the Trust for Mutual Understanding, um, from Barbara Lanciers and um, from you, Philip, in order to make some things that could be barriers um, for Martin to be present here, to be fully present here, to be supported, to be here, um, that the fact that those things have been possible has made things very um, doable, you know, as opposed to, oh, we want you, but you can only come for five days and not the whole process or whatever that is. So I think being able to find, hunt the resources somehow in order to make things happen um, has been really essential also to make this possible just on a really practical level. Well, maybe to add. Yeah, go ahead. Something interesting to mention that um, for me, when um, you and I, Philip, first talked about uh, a possible international collaboration or American-Hungarian collaboration, I I remember that I I wasn't uh, aware at all on. Um, like basic structural things, how theater works here, as opposed to uh, Hungary and Europe. So, for example, uh, the lack of uh, governmental um, funding, uh, which is not just a financial question, but uh, an attitude question and, and how um, self-esteem question and how much you you need to rely on uh, marketing and how much you need to rely on um, your members and your board and and your audience and uh, um, but for example um, seeing how different theaters operate within this condition um, I also learn so much about how you need to, how you can engage different communities and people who uh, really think of your work and of your theater as their own and uh, people who, um, for whom just uh, being part of uh, your, your work can become a lifestyle and become a, um, a routine and become a community. And so, uh, uh, every, every single time I return from a, a collaboration like this, this is this is one of my uh, takeaways. And also, um, yeah, just to see, um, yeah, learn learn different practices and and different um, um, words. Um, I, I I met so many amazing actors here, uh, and seeing how many actors are uh, here uh, available and hungry for for good uh, work um, and good <laughs> plays and good collaborations uh, we we had some unfortunate uh, obstacles throughout the way and and um, someone important from the cast uh, uh, from from this original reading that Jonathan mentioned, uh, we did in the summer couldn't take part because of COVID, and and uh, we needed to find someone uh, who who wouldn't who none of us would feel uh, is a compromise, and and magically uh, it turned out to be um, um, an amazing uh, meeting um, and. It, it was just, for example, something striking for me, how many actors are, how many great actors are in this city who, who can be available if, if, there is, if the offer is interesting enough. Well, we're about out of time. So it's time to give a little plug 
this piece will open Saturday night. Is that my understanding? Um, it officially opens the 20th, although what um, is opening the, virtually? But it starts the 20th of January, 2022. Because some of you might be seeing this in 2025, because one of the great things about HowlRound is that they archive this. So, you know, if this is something that, you know, you think your friend Nancy needs to see, she didn't lose out. Nancy can go to HowlRound and look up this on archives and see it. And then it will re it will, let's roll the tape back to 2022. It'll run until? Um, it'll run until February 13th. Okay. And um, I hope you will all get a chance to see it. I, I thank you all for a, a very enlightening hour with us. Uh, I'm so impressed with what you've done and so um, inspired by what you've done. Uh, so keep up the good work and uh, thank you hell around 10 years old, save your money. Peace everybody. <laughs>